making the clover. Yeah. Uh, what we would do is uh, we would go into basically a company patrol base, and then we would send out each platoon at a different azimuth for about maybe 300 meters. Uh, and they would do a clover loop and they would find whatever trails or other signs of activity were taking place. And then uh, based on the activity of the trail, you know, you could see what we call a high speed hard pack. It was about as wide as this table and it was just pounded dirt. And you could look at the dirt and see how uh, frequently people had been by there the last time they were there. You know, the thing you didn't want to see was tiny little bubbles in the mud because that meant they had just passed and they're very close to you. But you don't know where they are, but you just saw that they're there, there somewhere and they're going to find you first. You hope not. At uh, <clears throat> any rate, we would locate these trails and based on our study of the activities, we would set up these mechanical ambushes. Uh, and th I, that, I use that rather than put the troops physically across the trail uh, because that put them at too much risk. I didn't have enough forces to do very much other than call it light infantry uh, patrol and ambush techniques. Uh, the TOE of the company I think was like 125. I don't think I ever went to the field with more than 75. Uh, and that included, like I said, the Kit Carson scouts and the dog units and any other hanger on that happened to be there. Uh, <clears throat> we would uh, do this for maybe two weeks at a time and then we would be rotated back up on the fire base. Everybody hated the fire base because that was where all the spit and polish was and you had all the requirements and people supervising and uh, you know, it was just the troops didn't like it because it wasn't a break. They always had to fill sandbags or clear brush and all that. There was no uh, off time at all. You get in the bush, you can take things a little easier. And you can, hey, let's quit here for the moment. And so you quit and, uh, you know, you, you can relax the troops for a while because it's really exhausting. You have to understand the weather, you got two seasons, dry season and wet season. Dry season, it may be 90 degrees with equal humidity, and you're walking around on trails, you know, on hills that are like that. Very exhausting. And the troops are carrying their whole house with them and all their ammo. You know, and you, you get a troop, you fill them up with this stuff, and then you say, okay, you know, you got to have a minimum of 450 rounds of M16. Uh, you got to have at least 2,000 rounds of M60. Uh, they all got flares, trips, claymores, everything else, plus their own gear and in the dry season, water. You know, you have everybody's got a five quart canteen and at least three one quarts. And that's a lot of water and a lot of weight. So these guys are just like elephants, you know, staggering along, which is why I use patrol bases because you can't, you can't be alert when you're pumping all that stuff. You know, you got to dump it so you got some ability to maneuver around and look up instead of looking down all the time. Uh, <clears throat> so that was basically the routine. Lamson 719, uh, we were given an independent company mission uh, to protect Lao Bao, which was the f most forward uh, PZLZ for the invasion into Laos. Uh, it was right on overlooking my position overlooked the Lao border on QL5, the main road that went in toward Chipone. And we were the, it was the LZ for uh, the Rangers that were going in, plus some airborne and some other elements. Uh, we had uh, this place on the high ground that was kind of cleared out, and we had a long trench that ran along it. My company was responsible for the area security, uh, and it was complete chaos, if you can imagine, just literally uh, 50 to 100 helicopters coming in over the course of uh, two or three hours, just, you know, coming in from Quezon, dropping down, picking up the Rangers, 
flying off, then coming back. There was a refuel rearm point there. You had a big uh, talk, which I avoided assiduously, because it, it had, uh, had the Vietnamese there, the Corps commander, the division uh, commander, the uh, airborne and regimental brigade commanders and their staff, had an engineer, U.S. engineer unit that was there that was good people. I spent more time with them. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, it was complete chaos in the talk, and you wanted to get out of there because you were within grenade range of anybody that wanted to use you. Uh, the one th defining thing that I remember about that particular issue uh, was that about five miles away in Laos, uh, the NVA had dug in 122 guns, not howitzers, but guns. And you couldn't get at them, and they'd shoot at us. And this first time I'd been under artillery fire, and it was an exciting experience. Uh, you actually, the round landed before you heard it. So there was absolutely no warning whatsoever that you were going to get fired on. And they weren't very accurate, and it wasn't mass fires, but it was still artillery coming at you. And so we got down, we became troglodytes very quickly underground in, the, in these trenches and bunkers. And we came up with a system, an early warning system, which was to look at the side of, you could see the guns wink when they fired. And you could see the wink and then bang, like that. Uh, and you had no warning at all, you know. So we, f we figured out the only way we were going to do this is we had a guy who's, we had one task for one guy. He had an air horn, you know, the things you bring to football games and all that. And he would just, his mission was to look at the side of that hill. And as soon as he saw a wink, he hit the air, hit the air horn and everybody would drop down. And invariably it was immediately air horn, bang, you know, that was it. Uh, so that was an exciting experience. Uh, I'd never been under artillery, and that was the only time, and I don't want to be under artillery again. Uh, and the gun, the fact that it was a gun and not a howitzer made all the difference. With a howitzer, you know, you can hear the bang, and then there's the round, like a mortar, you know, clunk, and then bang. Uh, with a gun, it's just so fast. Uh, you, the round explodes before you have any inkling that it's coming in. Uh, uh, in yeah, in uh, Laobao, we were there about a little over a week. Uh, we were the uh, unit, we were the location where they evacuated the fire bases that the Rangers, LZs that the Rangers had been on, and it was complete chaos. I mean, the, by the second day of the incursion, the NVA had brought in a lot of AAA because they knew helicopters were the secret to success. And so they were shooting helicopters down left and right. They, we'd see these birds come in and they're smoking and limping and going like this and they'd crash basically on our LZ. And we had a big huge boneyard. Uh, we had a bulldozer and the bulldozer's job was just to push the helicopter off to one edge of the LZ uh, to get it out of the way, and it became quite a large mound of aviation junk there uh, beginning the, the end of the second day. The third day, you could actually see the AAA coming up against the Cobras uh, that were trying to provide fire. Uh, and they, it got so bad that all the helicopters had to be about 5,000 feet. And, you know, if you're a Cobra pilot, you're not going to be too accurate at 5,000 feet. But they didn't have any choice because they get shot out of the air. I mean, we could see them get hit and you take immediate evasive action uh, because of it. Uh, my total tour after, I, uh, after that, uh, I had about six months of command time. And then uh, they said, okay, you've got to go. You've had your command time. You've got to go on staff. So I got interviewed and ended up being the G2 operations officer for the division, which was a great job at that time. 
uh, because I was responsible for all of the arc light programming, the B-52 bombers. Uh, I had operational management of the 17th CAV, the aviation uh, CAV uh, element. Uh, I was responsible for all of the sensor strings, which is like 25,000 project duffel bag in Laos and on the north side of the border. And all of the intel up to the 20th parallel, which was about 15 miles inside North Vietnam. Uh, and I had this tremendous array of intelligence stuff. I and mean, I got a real class on uh, U.S. intelligence capabilities. Uh, we had uh, overhead. Uh, we had NSA, which was our major uh, asset, if you would, uh, as well as the cab. You know, we'd find targets or think there was something out there. We'd send the cab to go look at it. They'd part the canopy, and if they got shot at badly, we'd mark it, and then we would draw an arc light box. I got probably one arc light box every other day, which was a great many, which was really quite high volume, uh, and they just were very, very effective. Uh, we send the cab in to do BDA immediately after the arc light hit, and you know, they had some great reports as to the accuracy or not accuracy. You know, they knew if they got shot at after doing the BDA, they'd, the target, they didn't get the target. But if they went in there and they see guys all kind of stumbling around and the remnants of equipment, they knew that they got what they were supposed to get. And that professionally was extremely educational uh, because I was able to see the whole intelligence net at a larger level. You know, as a company commander, I get a report, hey, you know, we got dinks at Yankee Tango, blah, blah, blah. But at the division, with the nature of the requirements the division had, the responsibility of everything, basically, other than the Marines, uh, north of uh, the, uh, the DMZ south and into Laos, I just, it was just really great education. And you could see how the intel was put together. You know, the, the comm intel, the CAV birds, uh, the reports from other sources. Uh, we had these whole agent strings that were being run by the uh, CIA. They would come in and bring me, hey, we just got a uh, runner here, and he tells me there's a uh, NVA battalion that's moving down to Bintram 63 at this location, blah, blah, blah. And you put it all together, and, you know, it's kind of like a chess game. You figure out where the bad guys are and where, what you've got in the way of assets, and then you apply the force necessary. Um, so it was one of the best jobs in the world that I had uh, for this period. Uh, then I came home. I was the uh, S3 of the 1st 503rd and the 173rd. Uh, we became the 3rd Brigade of the, 80, of the 101st, uh, the uh, Airborne Brigade the 3rd Brigade, and then we phased out uh, of Airborne. And at that point, before we went off jump status, I joined the 1st of the 75th when it was started up by General Abrams. Uh, Colonel Luer, the battalion commander, was a battalion commander in the 101st when I was there, and I knew him. We, we had met. I had responsibility for the Da Nang ASP. And I turned it over to him. And so I, we had an interface for about a week. Uh, and then when uh, he came back and was given the job to start the Rangers with 175, uh, he asked me to come and be the headquarters company commander and plans officer, which I did. Uh, and that started, that's my career start with the Rangers uh, through battalion command of the same unit. Okay, I think we're going to have to pause there because you got to go to lunch. Yeah, i got to go to lunch. But 